Hello, welcome to the world of my simulations. Um, I've been working on these for a couple years, and they're very hard to explain to people. And, if, and uh, a few weeks ago, I thought of a way to maybe make them more transparent to people, uh, so people can get a better idea of what exactly it is I'm doing. Uh, this is sort of a new way of doing economic theory. Uh, I'll turn these on so you can you can start to see how they how they move around over time. This is a particular simulation. I've run many, many different versions of this, um, but uh, with lots of different specifications. This particular one, there are 300 agents in the economy that lies behind these results. There's 75 different goods uh, that are technologically available, you might say. Um, and and the agents are, are back there uh, producing these goods, trading these goods, they like to procure them. They have a they have a utility function they're trying to maximize. The utility function is such that they have a taste for variety, so they like to have a lot of different goods. There's also fixed cost to producing any particular good, um, so that encourages them to to specialize as producers, but then diversify a lot as as consumers. And we'll see a little bit more about what that means. But I'll start with the upper left hand corner, and here you show you have all the 75 goods uh, are displayed in this chart. And um, you have on the vertical dimension here, you have uh, L0, that measures how hard to make they are. Alpha, that measures how well liked the goods are. And um, so you can, as you can imagine, goods down in this corner, these are well liked and they're fairly easy to make. So these are desirable industries. Um, these goods are much less so, they're not that well liked and they're pretty hard to make. So. Um, and generally speaking, you've got black, those represent active industries, there's retailers trading, um, there's people consuming. Blue is goods that people are consuming, but they're just self-supplying them. There's no retailers who provide these. Red represent goods that are tradable. There's retailers who are trying to supply them, but they, uh, nobody's consuming them at the moment. So they're probably, they're trying to get into the business, but not succeeding. And then the yellow represent goods that are, are neither uh, being traded nor being consumed. Let's see how much money, uh, uh, how much... Uh, I've uh, used so far. Okay, well that's reasonable. Um, so, okay, about about two and a half minutes. Okay, I'll keep going. So, um, uh, so you see, so so that keeps switching around, but there's a certain amount of stability. So some industries are fairly well established and stable. And notice there are a lot of goods that aren't being used. That's actually very important for theoretical reasons. These are I call latent technologies. So they're things that you wouldn't even know they're there if you're just looking at the data about what's being traded. But actually, these are known. They are available. And if you had a larger economy, if you had more capital, maybe you would bring in the, a lot of those into production. Um, and so this contrasts, by the way, with many uh, economic theories which will either ignore the diversity of goods altogether, that's kind of common because economic theories tend to simplify things a lot in order to make them easy to understand, uh, to make the logic clear, uh, to allow them to be solved, but uh, consequently they'll ignore some very important things like the fact that there's lots of different goods out there. Other theories will recognize there are a lot of different goods, but will make them exactly symmetric. Um, so here you have a lot of goods, and they're actually different from each other. They're not symmetric. They have different uh, characteristics, uh, albeit just these two dimensions. Um, okay, so next, um, we have, this is uh, weirdly titled, Chart Overhead Self-Supply Market Retailing. These are four different ways that people can use their labor. So overhead... This is to initiate production processes. This is like the time you spend setting up your machinery or uh, driving to work um, or maybe learning how to do a task. You're not actually producing anything. You're just uh, getting ready to produce. So that's overhead labor. And you see the green, the area between the bottom of the chart and the green line represents this overhead labor. Next, self-supply. This is stuff that you make for yourself. And you see, in this economy, there's actually not very much of it. There's a lot of agents, there's a lot of goods, people don't really, uh, they, they pretty much specialize, most of their time they devote to market labor, that's the biggest category, you see the blue here is market labor, and so that gap, that's the biggest, so that's when you're, you're working for other people's benefit, um, or indirectly for your own benefit, you're working to earn money, um, you're not making anything that you're going to use, 
So that's that category. And then this last category is the time that people devote actually to retailing. So the markets here are run, I, are run by agents. What they do is they set up retailers and then they just um, buy and sell some particular good, they specialize in some particular good and keep buying and selling it. And I require them in order to run a retailer to spend 80% of their time just sitting there running the retailer so they don't have as much labor to devote to other things. So that's another use of their labor in that. So you can see the fourfold distribution of people's labor. Um, so it looks like I've gone about about five and a half minutes. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so in, this chart's important because it shows utility. So utility is the goal. So one thing you see at, at the beginning they had pretty low utility, but, but now they've risen to something that's kind of like a rough steady state sort of in the long term it stays more or less the same. There's a good deal of randomness in this, so it does sort of shift up and down, but um, but it seems like it, it's kind of at the same level. And uh, importantly, so this compares retailers and non-retailers. And this one actually, it, it, this works out a little bit differently each time. And the goal, you know, the goal is to have retailers and non-retailers roughly the same because it seems like the retailers are a little irrational if they're enjoying less consumption than the non-retailers, but you see that that's, that's what's happening here. But they're not that much worse off. Uh, and the reason for this is that people go into retailing when they look around and they see retailers are doing well. And if they look around and they see that their friends, uh, the retailers look around and see their friends who aren't in retail are doing well, then the retailers will tend to exit. So there's a kind of an, a sort of a rough equilibrium here between retailing and non-retailing. This chart is important. You can barely see the little blue line near the bottom that represents goods made. It's basically around one. It's the average goods made, so it'll vary a little bit, but it's, uh, and then goods used much more. So the agents get to, to use a lot more goods than they can make for themselves. So that's the advantage um, of specialization, um, which is kind of the, the crucial feature of this model is that it allows for specialization. So agents get to consume a lot more goods uh, than they produce. Okay, I've got another view that I prepared. Now, this one looks at um, a particular agent. And uh, let's go up to the top here. Um, so, okay, this agent you can see is utility each turn. It's changing a little bit. Um, so, sort of fluctuating, rising and falling. Uh, he's trying to do his best. Over here are the retailers that he knows. So they're all kind of sorted out. Um, by what good they sell and then by what their prices are and and then the check marks check boxes mark the goods that he knows how to make um, and if he doesn't use his skills he loses them but he picks up new ones kind of uh, so um, tends to keep the skills that he's using so we'll pause this and we'll look down a little bit I'm trying to understand how he makes the decision wait a minute let's see if we have time um, okay we've got a little bit of time left so um, so, so age. In fact, I'm going to switch it up and, and pick another one. And there's actually a lot of these, you know. And then, it's interesting. I never seem to hit on the retailers just by chance. But if I deliberately pick one that's a retailer like number one fifty nine, so that it shows what retailer he owns there next to it. There's 74 retailers in business out of 300 agents, so um, so quite a few people are engaged in retail. But, um, okay, but let's pick one who isn't. So, um, okay, so 100, okay, he's not doing too bad for some 4.7. Um, uh, okay, so this guy, he has one unit of labor, this guy is completely specialized, devotes it to producing good 39, um, and he sells it, Some he has to spend 0.561 just getting started on that process, he sells it um, for 0 0.249, and then he earns, it looks like about 5, uh, so he earns 1 all altogether. You can see in this column what he pays um, for each of the goods. And you see it's, it's less than, I mean, it's less than his earnings because he has to distribute the money that he earns over all the different goods he can consume. Um, and so then, so he consumes 
uh, a lot of different goods. So he's got a pretty diversified consumption, much more specialized um, in production. Um, and if you look at these, it's, it'll be sort of related, it tends to be sort of related to, to what a good uh, cost, but it's also related to the price. Anyway, I'm probably um, out of time, so